<laughs> it's going we are. live. We're live. Yay. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think there's, I, I'm questioning it, like, am I there? And then I, then I am. So I'm just going to assume we're <laughs> alive because we always are when I'm, I'm wondering if we are. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm. Good morning, Amy. Seeing that we're um, live. Welcome, beautiful people. Brentwood Inspired Living Center is in the Facebook house. Yay. <laughs> it's in the house. How is everyone doing? Do you get it? Do you see it, TJ? Yes. Yes. You who we morning, are. Everyone. <laughs> nice. How is everybody? Drop some comments for us. Tell us that you're here. Give us some hearts, some thumbs up. Let mm. us know that you can see us and hear us. <clears throat> Important part of our Facebook Live is to be able to see us and hear us. So <laughs> that's important. Tell us hello. I'm looking for you on my phone to check your comments. Oh, there we go. Hello, everybody. We've got um, everybody logging on. Ronnie's here. Good morning. Steven's here. Good morning, Christy, Don. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Today we have TJ Woodward here, and he's going to share his message with us about rising above collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yay. Excellent conversation for us today. So, um, and then we have Brittany. We're so excited. She's tuning in with our May themes of aliveness today, sharing a couple of songs. Uh, we're so grateful. And Jan Knight, our wonderful board president, is here reading our inspirational story for the day. So we are all set and ready. We're going to just allow a couple minutes right here to uh, give everyone the opportunity to see that we are live and pop on here with us. Good morning, Jenny, Maria, Nancy, Bonnie, and Lori. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad to see you. Welcome. Welcome, beautiful community. We're so grateful when you jump on here and join us. We send you love and blessings. Pat is here. Good morning. Great. How are you, everybody? Let us know in the comments. Keep the comments coming. Check in with us. Denise is here. Good morning. What have you been up to? What have you been up to? I'm in San Diego. Um, I've been soaking up the sun and the, the ocean air. And this morning, it's really overcast and it's actually very nice and cool. Good morning, Paris. She says, I can actually type a comment today. Yay. I know some, <laughs> some weeks, some people can't get comments in. Yeah. I'm not sure why that is, but we're glad when you can. So just remember that you can type in your comments and questions uh, during TJ's talk and we'll get to them after he finishes uh, his talk and we'll do a little Q&A. So good morning, everybody. We're giving just a few minutes to let everybody pop on here. How's it going? I saw a funny um, graphic, I think it was yesterday on Instagram um, and it was, uh, it was like a concrete poem, like the shape of a sun. And in the middle, it said, <clears throat> try to do something different every day. And then there was like a list, you know, that came out like a sun, like the rays of sun. And there were different words and different things like, um, you know, do a puzzle, make a puzzle or take a digital tour online or write a long letter, bake something, try yoga, all these good ideas. And then suddenly um, cut your bangs and Google your ex. And I thought, hmm, well, I'm, I'm thinking unless you, you know, have some training in the haircut, maybe skip the bangs. And if there hasn't been any contact with the ex in some years, I'm going to say, just leave that one alone. <laughs> but I'll post that in our group because it was kind of cute. Okay. Ron is here. Dusty is here. Luisa, good morning, Randy. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad when you join us, everybody's popping on. Reminder that at 1130, we will meet on Zoom for our interactive connection time. Um, I'm thinking after our candle lighting today, maybe we'll do a little check-in with like our most embarrassing moment in life or something like that. <laughs> something fun. <laughs> um, so be thinking about this. Maybe we'll just do um, something you're really pleased about or satisfied in life. So it's a fun time to connect and chat. So join us there. Uh, the Zoom link is on our homepage, um, brentwoodilc.org, and it's also in a post, I believe I dropped right here this morning, so just scroll down and check that out. Christy's here. Good morning. Dave is here. Good morning, everybody. We love when you pop on with us. We feel you. We love you. We send you blessings and thoughts of health and wholeness. 
Oh yeah. Jenny says she likes to hear the birds. You know what? There are so many birds around here. It's a beautiful, amazing backyard. And there is a little teeny tiny hummingbird nest is the mama in there. She was in there this morning and it is just amazing. Betty's here. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Seeing Betty's name reminds me um, if anybody would like affirmative prayer for yourself or someone else, please reach out to our prayer team. Um, you can find all the information about um, our prayer team and, and leading prayer requests on our website on our prayer and healing page. Um, our prayer team is ready to go with affirmative prayer, which is positive life affirming prayer. Good morning, Bob. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. So check that out on our website, the prayer and healing page. We have some other resources there. Let us know if you need anything at all. So it looks like everybody is jumping on with us. Jennifer is here. Good morning. Yay. Good morning, everybody. We're so grateful for your presence with us on this Facebook Live. We feel you. Leave comments for us. Let us know that you can hear us and see us. We have Brittany with us today and TJ with us today and Jan. Yay. Wonderful. So we're just going to go ahead and get rolling. Beverly's joined us. So we have a good group here and I know more friends will jump on and, and that'll be great. So I'll keep an eye on this. So remember that uh, just drop your comments and your questions. We love to hear from you. So I am going to just begin us um, by sharing our mission statement. We have a fantastic mission statement here at Brentwood Inspired Living Center. And I invite you to just take a nice inhale and just feel into this mission statement. We are an open heart centered spiritual community honoring the one presence within us we welcome all to connect, grow, and expand in wisdom, compassion, and love. So Jan has our inspirational reading for us this morning. Um, I've also posted it. She made a lovely video. I posted it on our, our page so you can go back and, and watch just the uh, story if you'd like later. So thank you, Jan, for joining us. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here again and to share with you another a search for a wonderful story related to our theme of aliveness. And so this time I found uh, a story taken from a book and which was in a blog called uh, thriveglobal.com. It's a website of an organization, worldwide organization. And this is taken from a book called Shortcuts to Happiness, Life-Changing Lessons from My Barber by Tal Ben-Shahar. And here's one of the lessons that he put in his book from, that he learned from his barber. It's called On Taking a Break. Mornings were my favorite time of day to get a haircut. There were always fewer people and more one-on-one -on -one time with my barber. On a cold, wintry morning in January of 2016, Avi greeted me, as he often did with his song du jour, the one that, in his words, would take me places. And this one was by an Israeli singer, Idan Rahel, with a call to action to embrace every opportunity of every day, since who knows when we'll run out of chances. Avi told me that he had decided to not let any chances, any more chances go by in his life. He wanted to take a break to spend more time reading, more time listening to music, more time visiting new places. And so periodically he would close his shop for a week or even a month and he would head off on a journey. He knew that this practice wasn't great for his business and that beyond the fact that he wasn't earning any money while he was away, he might even have some customers leave. He also knew though that there was more important things than his business. Avi often asked himself this question, if I had one week to live, what would I do? I have been asked this question many times before in many self-help seminars. And, but coming from Avi, it seemed to carry more weight. I knew him well enough to recognize that for him, the question wasn't merely academic. He was living the answer. Avi spoke about how no matter if we have a week or 50 years of life ahead of us, life always seems too short 
for what we want to do, and at some point, it ends. So why wait? Moreover, he added, even if I do live to be a hundred, I don't want to visit the Wall of China and be carried up in a golf cart. I want to run up the stairs. <laughs> There's a Buddhist practice that I always thought was extreme, though interesting, which involves meditating in a cemetery. The purpose of this practice is to focus attention on the temporary nature of reality and hence on what truly matters right in the present moment. I doubt that Avi ever had a sitting session among the graves. He didn't really need the dead to remind him to live. See you in a few days, I said. I'm off to London tomorrow. And I thanked him. He smiled and he reminded me, have a wonderful journey. So I say to you, have a wonderful journey. Have a wonderful day. And it's great to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much for that story. I love it. I love it. Okay, we're going to move on to Brittany. She's got a song for us today. A couple songs for us. We're going to start with this one. I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. And thank you, Jan, for that story. Yeah. It's really heartwarming. This song I chose today um, for the theme Aliveness, it, when you told that story, it reminded me of this song because the person who wrote this song um, had been diagnosed with something and they their days were shorter than they expected. And they wrote this song about it, it's called I Lived. And I almost couldn't get through this song every time I played it because it was so emotional. Um, it's really about wanting to, we're, we came here to experience the full spectrum of emotion. And it's really just about delving into that and accepting that. Take that jump and don't fear the fall. Hope when the water rises, you may roll. Hope when the crowd screams out, you're screaming your name. Hope if everybody runs. Choose to stay. I hope that you fall in love and it hurts so bad. The only way you know you give it all that you can. I hope you don't suffer, but you take the pain. Thank you. 
I know the sound was a little off. We were working with microphones this morning, but thank you. I love that song. It's such a beautiful song. It's One Republic you. if you want to look it up and yeah, really hear it super well. Thank you. You're beautiful, Brittany. Thank you for sharing that with us. <clears throat> okay, so we have embarked upon our virtual prosperity time. So I invite you in this moment to become very conscious about prosperity. So if we were in person at our center, we would be um, taking this moment to stop, open our hearts to the abundance within us, around us. And we have this little phrase, attitude of gratitude. So we focus on gratitude at this time. And we focus on gratitude because we've learned that gratitude multiplies the good. You know, there's this energy, there's vibration around gratitude. And the good, the good is the abundance in our lives. And abundance all around us is this all sufficient supply, you know, like a full measure of infinite, infinite possibility, infinite love, infinite potential. So we talk about this stuff and it's all true. It's all absolutely true. And yet sometimes we don't necessarily or really understand what that looks like or feels like in life. Um, it, it's easy to talk about on Sunday morning when we're together, prosperity, but um, sometimes we just know it in our heads intellectually. But let's just pause for a moment right here and really feel into abundance and gratitude. What does that mean? So I'm in a, a home this week um, that's overflowing with abundance. This uh, tree, I don't know if you can see it right above me, is exploding with grapefruit. The one right next to me is navel oranges and lemons behind me in the front yard. There's a tree full of avocados just <laughs> exploding. And I could walk by and say, oh, you know, the house is, you know, 1200 square feet or something, not elaborate. But is that true? You know, from what lens do I see? Do I look at the world? Do I look at my surroundings? So I walk around here and I am just like soaking in this abundance. Um, every single day, I drink a ton of herbal tea with lemons. So this is just like heaven, you know, coming, pulling a lemon off the tree. So this is, this is um, a deep appreciation and it's a prayer of gratitude. So that's gratitude when we're looking around and we're seeing from this lens. Um, of abundance. So that's the thing is that when we appreciate what we have in our lives, we increase the value of that's the multiplying the good gratitude is a mindset. It's a choice. It's um, and, and then a choice is a function of our awareness, right? So we're, we have our personal interpretation of life and this affects how we feel and how we see the world and um, creates a state of being our state of being. And then our state of being um, comes a strategy about how we live our life. And that's sometimes called an attitude. So um, we literally attract what we hold in mind. And this is because what we hold in mind becomes our, our frequency, our vibration, our feeling tone. Um, so um, we're abundant and we can tap into that. This is our natural, natural um, space. That's our natural program. Gratitude is the magic that changes that vibration for us. It is, it is, it's a magic tool. It, I mean, even science looks at the brain and says, when you're in gratitude, these things happen to you physiologically, you know, it's really amazing. So um, it is a magic tool to, to use and tap into. So please join with me in this moment um, in energizing with your thoughts, with your prayers, with your intentions, the infinite supply in your life, in the, in the infinite supply of Brentwood Inspired Living Center. And you know what? This might take a little extra minute right here because it's been 10 weeks, I think it's 10 weeks, nine or 10 weeks since we have set 
foot in our physical space together. Think about that. That's kind of long. <laughs> so let's just take this moment to extend our heart space and feel um, into the gratitude for one another, our community, our sacred space, our sanctuary, our fellowship area, our kitchen, our inspiration nook, our prayer room. What did I miss? Our children's center, all of it, and feel appreciation for all the times we've gathered together in that space and been together hugging and enjoying one another. So with this expression, with this feeling of gratitude, um, we just become part of this dance in our giving and receiving in the universe. And so we can just declare right now that we are not only in the flow, that we are the flow. We're our, we are the flow. And I think it was Ami Tobin who said that once. And I just loved when he said that. It's like, we're, we are the flow. So I invite you to just feel into this deep gratitude right now, knowing that the the universe God bends around our feeling tone. So allow that feeling tone to be one of thanksgiving um, and gratitude. So thank you for your conscious and loving contributions. I want to say that Dave picks them up from the mailbox. We also receive them on Zelle and PayPal. And thank you for your notes that you send. I have seen them all. I read them all. Um, we are full of gratitude gratitude and gratefulness and thanksgiving so thank you for your generous contributions um okay so uh thank you for feeling into that with me i was uh going over that last night going through all the rooms in our in our sacred space and it was really fun to to feel into that so thank you and so let's move on to our next song that Brittany has for us and everyone's so quiet i guess you're all mu muted <laughs> We are muted. <laughs> I'm back now. Okay, good. <laughs> it might be better for me just to sing this a cappella right at you guys, if if that will help with the sound rather than turning towards the piano. Yeah, let's do that. So, let's try that. Yeah. So this is from Wicked, Defying Gravity, and it's just one of the most energizing and inspiring songs that I know. Something has changed within me. Something is not the same. I'm through with playing by the rules of someone else's game. Too late for second guessing. Too late to go back to sleep. It's time to trust my instincts. Close my eyes and leap. It's time to try defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity and you won't bring me down. I'm through accepting limits because someone says they're so some things I cannot change, but till I try, I'll never know. Too long I've been afraid of losing love, I guess I've lost. Well, if that's love, it comes at much too high a cost. I'd sooner buy defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity. Kiss me goodbye. I'm defying gravity and you won't bring me down. And if I'm flying solo, at least I'm flying free to those who'd ground me. Take a message back from me. Tell them how I am defying gravity. Kiss me goodbye. I'm defying gravity. I think I'll try defying gravity. And no one can bring me down. Bring me down. Oh. Oh. 
Wow. <laughs> I hope that you could hear that. Oh, um, Brittany, that was beautiful. The comments say you have an amazing voice. You don't need accompaniment. I have to agree. <laughs> you are just amazing. So Thank you. I love that song. It reminds me of. Oh, it's beautiful. I know. Did um, yeah, Wicked on Broadway. Uh, watching that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brittany for sharing with us. I, I just really felt into that. Thank you. And thank you, Jan, for sharing your story. That was a great story. I appreciate both of you so much for joining us this morning. I love you both. I'll see, we'll see you on the other side on, on Facebook Live. Ronnie says, bravo. Luinda says, beautiful voice. Thank you, Brittany. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you so See you on Facebook. Bye, everybody. Love you both. Okay, yay. Here we are, and it is my joy and my honor to welcome TJ Woodward with us today. Uh, I get to read what a special human being he is to you. TJ Woodward is a revolutionary recovery expert, best selling author, inspirational speaker, and addiction treatment specialist who has helped countless people through his simple yet powerful teachings. He is the creator of the Conscious Recovery Method, which is a groundbreaking and effective approach to viewing and treating addiction. TJ is a fe featured thought leader on wholehearted.org, along with Brene Brown, Gabor Mate, Mark Lundholm. And he was also given the honor of being ordained as an Agape minister by Dr. Michael Beckwith and is the founding minister of Agape Bay Area in Oakland, which is the first satellite community of the Agape International Spiritual Center in LA, which is a very cool time. I remember when that happened. TJ is the author of the books, Conscious Being, Awakening to Your True Nature and Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction. His website is tjwoodward.com if you'd like to know more about this wonderful human being. Thank you, TJ, for being with us today. Uh, we're so grateful. I want to remind everybody that um, we will have Q&A after TJ's talk when he concludes. So if you have any questions, um, what did you say, TJ? Questions, comments, and smart remar remarks? Yes, it's all well. They're all welcome. <laughs> all welcome. We love it all. Pop them in the comments uh, during the talk, and that way when we he concludes, we can um, go through them and answer those at the end. So that's really a fun time to connect as well. So I'm going to go ahead here and pray us in and then hand the screen over to TJ. Uh, we're so grateful. Oh, so if you just join me in taking a big inhale as we just feel into the gratitude of community. Thankful for this moment that we have this opportunity to fill up with inspiration and infinite possibilities. We allow ourselves to commune with the presence of good, with God, with abundance, with health. And we claim and declare that all is well. We connect ourselves to the loving, peaceful, divine essence that we are. And we open up to TJ's message, his blessing today. In gratitude, we share the light with everyone because we are one. And so it is. And so it is. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, TJ. Mm, thank you, Amy. Wow, welcome everyone. I'm so incredibly grateful that we have this opportunity in this moment to connect. There are so many different ways to connect and each of us is being called now to discover new ways to find connection. I wanna start with gratitude because I like to always tune into the frequency of gratitude anytime I speak. Huge gratitude to Amy for you know, being part of this community, steering this community as one of the leaders of the community and gratitude for all of you that are tuning in right now. Brentwood Inspired Living Center is a remarkable place. It's a remarkable energy and a remarkable frequency. And it's interesting that in the bio, you know, Amy talks about Agape Bay Area, all of the ministers from Agape Bay Area love to come to Brentwood to speak. So I just wanted to say that because when we're in conversations, we're always talking about, gosh, aren't they amazing? Isn't that love energy so powerful there? So thank you for that, Amy, and for everyone who's part of uh, maintaining and allowing this community to thrive. Jan, thank you for that incredible story. I was really feeling a lot of emotion during that story 
because it was so in alignment with what I've been called to speak to today. And then Brittany, that song, my gosh, it's exactly the launching point that I want to start from. Your voice is incredible. Your presence is incredible. And that song really speaks to exactly how I want to start this conversation. Think about gravity for a moment. Think about the gravitational pull that is gravity. Now imagine trying to fight or resist gravity, uh, thinking that somehow you're going to eradicate gravity. Now, thinking about that, most of us would say, well, that's a little crazy, don't you think, that we're gonna be able to beat gravity? But if we look at gravity as collective consciousness, are we trying to fight collective consciousness? Because here's the thing, we cannot change the wind, but we can adjust our sails, right? Now, as cliche as that may sound, I wanna lean into it for a moment and really ask ourselves, what does that actually mean? Because right now there is a lot happening in our world. There is a lot happening on social media. There's a lot happening in the mainstream media. There's a lot happening in Zoom calls and phone calls where people are sharing information. And I'm gonna use the quotes because we're gonna talk about that more, but they're sharing and co-creating what we call gravity during this time or collective consciousness. And rather than thinking we need to fight against that because the litmus test is, how is it working trying to change everybody's point of view about what's happening in the world? Or can I look at it for what it is? And that is something that is alive in relative reality. Can I move from fighting and resisting that? And this is, these are a few ways that we know if we're fighting or resisting the collective consciousness or the gravity of this situation. If I'm hearing myself or saying, either hearing it in my mind or saying it out loud, they should not be saying that or doing that, or that group has it wrong, or that group is right, or why is that politician not dot, dot, dot. That's all in what we call collective consciousness or relative reality. The more I resist that, the stronger the gravitational pull is for me. I'm going to repeat that. The more I resist that, the stronger the gravitational pull of that is. So let's talk about the topic, which is rising above collective consciousness. I, of course, did not know Brittany was going to do that song, but it's such a perfect framework that we're going to keep using that analogy. So if we looked at look at collective consciousness as gravity, you can't really see gravity. But none of us, I don't think, would deny that gravity is there. In other words, we're not going to say there's no such thing as gravity. Well, first of all, if we didn't have gravity, what would happen? We need gravity, right? There's a purpose for it. But the issue that many of us are experiencing, if we look at it again as a metaphor for collective consciousness, we then might go to the next place, which is, well, there's nothing I can do about gravity. I just need to let go and let it take me. Now, on one level of reality, that is true, but we also now know how to fly, right? We also now have the ability to recognize that we don't have to fight gravity. An airplane doesn't fight gravity. It learns how to work with it so that it can soar, right? So. What I'm saying in all of this is right now there is a pandemic and the largest pandemic that's happening in our world is the pandemic of fear. That's actually the gravity that is keeping people felt, feeling like they're stuck or afraid. So I wanna talk a little bit about reality. Many of us believe that what we can see, what we hear, what we can touch and taste, the, the senses are reality. But we actually know in our new thought teachings that that is what we call relative reality. And that reality is always changing. And if you wanna um, try this on, find a point of view about what's happening in the world and Google it. You will find someone that will tell you it is a fact, regardless of what your point of view is. So for some, it is a fact that we are being um, forced to stay inside and we should be able to do whatever we want. 
For others, it's a fact that people should, if they go outside of their house, they don't care about others, right? All these points of view live in relative reality. And the human mind tends to go into right and wrong and good and bad. What happens when we go into right, wrong, good, bad, we miss the deeper opportunity. And the deeper opportunity is to recognize that there is something beyond relative reality. And that is ultimate reality. And that is our oneness with the flow of our divinity. I love that we're, we are the flow. We're not in the flow. Right, so when I truly know who and what I am as an infinite being, I am less afraid of what we call relative reality. Going back to Jan's story about meditating in the cemetery. Now that also is a really nice story, but I want us to actually lean in. Life is impermanent as we know it. Things come and go in the world, people die. I have actually had people say to me, well, if one person dies from this, it's one too many. But really think about that for a moment. That is the natural order of planet Earth. There is birth, there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. Now we know, spiritually, there is no end. And this is what I want to speak to. When I really know that, not as a concept, but a deep knowing, I am less afraid of my own death. And if I'm less afraid of my own death, I'm more interested in how I can live. That's why death teaches us a lot about life. And we, in our culture, are pretty much, uh, I think that there is a large fear around our own mortality. But what I wanna invite is, what do we think that's really about? Might it be that I, am afraid that I haven't lived my life to the fullest. So to the best of our ability, can we recognize that fear is the pandemic and we can plug into that frequency and the frequency of fear, because let me break something down for fear. And I really look forward to comments on this because it's a slightly provocative statement. Fear is a belief from the past projected into the perceived not now. I'm gonna say it again. Fear is, and I'm gonna, I might say it a little bit differently, but fear is really our unresolved past projected into a perceived not now, right? What I haven't resolved from my past gets projected onto, I hope that doesn't happen again. I think the last time I spoke here on our Zoom call, I talked about the telephone game. And the telephone game, if you remember when you were a kid, you would sit in a circle and you would whisper something to the person to the right of you, and then they would go to the next person, the next person. And by the time it came around to the original person, the story wouldn't even be anywhere near the way it started. So that's collective consciousness. Stories get told, assumptions get made, things get passed from one person to another, and they're not even reality. So for example, I love all of you on social media, but I'm gonna be really clear, we are not on lockdown. If you wanna to talk to someone that's been to prison or to jail, why don't you ask them what lockdown is? We are not on lockdown, but we're using that word. That word is a fear frequency word that is telling me I don't have a choice. But the reality is that's not even the guidelines. Now, let me be clear. Some of you, some of us might put ourselves in what we consider to be a high risk group and we're choosing to stay inside for our own safety and for the well-being of others. But there is more to life than just physical health. And I really want to speak to that because what we're focusing on primarily during this is our physical well being, but we have mental well being, emotional well being, and spiritual well being. I'm going to talk about each of those. What gets created in the mental room when you hear the word lockdown? Think about it for a moment lockdown, 
right? Am I locking myself down? Am I barricading myself? Am I putting up a wall? That's the word lockdown. Someone started saying it and then it spread like wildfire. There is no restriction of a lockdown right now, just to be clear, right? And so that's an example. Even the word quarantine, the word quarantine means that I'm also locked down. And again, some people are choosing to quarantine <clears throat> because of a particular group that they're in. But let's look at mental, mental well-being for a moment. What gets created when I think I'm supposed to stay inside at all times and barricade myself, protect myself? What gets created in the mental room and how do I have well-being in the midst of that? Uh, what would it be like to recognize that the collective consciousness is actually reporting something that's not even the guideline, right? So we start passing a story around like the telephone game. You know, I, I've heard all kinds of absurd things that have, that have seemed to be totally opposite of each other. And it's because people are spreading stories and we don't even know what the reality of the situation is, okay? So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. The other is the emotional well-being. When I don't create a space for me to become intimate with my emotional nature, I will project it outward. The number one gift I can offer myself and the world right now is to pause and to allow myself to feel whatever is present. Can I experience my emotion without a story or a without judgment? Because many of us, and then there's this place of compassion because most of us, if not all of us have been taught it's not okay to feel certain things. We've been taught that some feelings are good and some things, feelings are bad. Again, that's the mind, good, bad, right, wrong. Our mind tends to think in black and white. But learning how to be present with my emotions is the greatest gift I can offer myself in the world. Because if I allow myself to simply say, I notice I'm feeling sad, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to cry right now. It's okay to be happy right now. That's another one. You know, how dare you be happy? We're in a worldwide pandemic. I've heard people say that. That's insensitive to have joy. Every emotion is perfectly okay, no matter what. And because we're in the midst of this, some of those feelings might have gotten heightened. And again, many of us have a program that this feeling is good and this feeling is bad. Working in the mental health field, I cannot tell you how many times I've been to clinical trainings where they make a list of negative emotions and positive emotions. And the goal is to try to help our clients move into the positive column. But that's not really what emotions are. Emotions are a part of the spiritual and human experience. They are guideposts. They are letting us know something. So when I can be curious about my emotion and always starting with, I notice I'm feeling whatever it is, it's okay for me to feel that now. Because here's what happens. If I don't allow myself to feel it, I go into a story about it, and then I go into a projection. In other words, I'm feeling this because uh, the president did something. Well, if you're giving the president of the United States the power over your emotions, I invite you to take a look at that. And again, let's look without judgment. Uh, most of us have not even met some of these political figures, and yet we're living in blame that they are creating our emotional experience. I'm inviting us to take our power back and say, my emotions are mine, 100%. There's a great tool around emotions that I love, and I, I can't remember which book it came from, but I'll try to remember uh, by the end of this talk because I want you to have the reference point, but it's so simple. If I say I feel like or I feel that, it's not an emotion. Right, I feel like uh, the government should be doing more. I feel like people shouldn't be outside so much. I feel like we should all be allowed to go out and do whatever we want. Do you hear that? Those are not emotions. There's nothing wrong with those, but those are perspectives and points of view. The emotional 
experience is actually a sensation in our body. Can I create a space to allow myself to feel it? So you might ask why I'm spending so much time on this. Collective consciousness gets fueled by fear. And if I'm not willing or able to feel what I'm feeling, I'm going to, as I said, project it on to someone or something else and blame them. And then we build coalitions. We find people that have our same point of view and we create groups. Those could even be called political parties, right? But they're also called communities. They're also called Facebook groups. Uh, we build people that agree with us and then that gets concretized and it, man it magnifies. Nothing inherently wrong with that. But what I wanna invite is the simple question, how is it working? Is it serving me to build coalitions of people that agree with me? And is it working for me to really blame someone or something else for my emotional experience? Emotional well being and emotional health is learning how to be present with what is and having love and compassion for my, my emotional experience. So, the spiritual room what is spiritual well being? To me, it comes down to a very, very simple word, and that is connection. Connection primarily with my essential nature, and then secondarily, connection with each other. And we're living in a time where many of us are not having as much physical connection as we might really desire. So we're being called right now to look within and ask ourselves, can we connect really deeply with the truth of our being? Because very simply said, when I'm connected with or recognize my oneness with my source energy, I am not as pulled by the conditions of life. Does that mean I have no opinions or point of view? Absolutely not. If you, it, you can ask my husband. Yes, I have points of view. Yes, I have opinions. The key though is to recognize I have opinions, but I'm not my opinions. And if you want to have a fast track to suffering, believe you are your opinions. A fast track to pain and separation, believe that you are your thoughts. So then freedom becomes a really different question or a different possibility. It's not what happens in the world that creates my state of freedom. It's an inside job. And what happens is when I connect with that deeper reality, I am less pulled and pushed by life. And I actually can be in a place of, as Amy said so beautifully earlier, a place of abundance. Because, you know, New Thought 101, what I focus on grows. New Thought 101, where I put my attention is what I'm going to experience more of. I have the ability to call it something and therefore create my reality. But here's the key, and this is where I think New Thought has, uh, let's say slipped up. I think that's been interpreted a lot as pretending like this isn't happening. Like, let's pretend like, oh, I'm not afraid, I'm fine, I'm spiritual. I, I, I'm oh so spiritual, I know how to say there's only love here, but there's also a lot of pain in the world right now. What is it like to acknowledge that all of that is true, but what I call it has a profound effect. Someone posted on, um, on Facebook the other day, a picture of the good year blimp. And they said, false advertising, exclamation point. Good year, right? Now, even though I think on one level, that's funny, but this person is saying that this year is not good. And I'm thinking, first of all, it's only May. So have you decided that all, you know, I, already the memes are coming up. 2020, I want a refund. Uh, no, thank you, 2020, right? And so those are collective conscious paradigms that we, we can easily fall into if we're not aware. So the key is awareness. What does it create when I buy into the point of view that 2020 is a horrible year? Because here's the reality. There is always birth. There is always death. There is always rebirth. Uh, there are always things we can point to that we can call horrific. And there are always things we can point to that, are that we call beautiful. So we're not saying 
that this doesn't exist and let's pretend like it doesn't exist. But what we're inviting today in this conversation of rising above collective consciousness is I don't have to buy into the paradigm of fear. I can recognize it for what it is. It's a byproduct, I think, of people not being able to manage what's happening internally so it gets projected outward. And along with fear comes its byproduct, judgment. How dare you do this? How dare you not do this? And so we look at that and we look at what it's creating, where it's creating division. And what we know, what I know to be true is that there's something much greater beyond the division that we can perceive as happening. There's something much greater that's beyond the fear that we might see happening. There is the experience of the oneness of the love that we are. So we're gonna open it up for questions here in a few moments for comments. I think Amy's probably gonna be reading a few of them to me. Uh, Amy and I will both probably take some of these and talk about our experience with them. But what I wanna say in closing is this, you have the ability at this moment to change your frequency and to tune into something that is much truer than anything that you could read or hear right now. We can acknowledge the fear is there. We can even honor the fear. We can have compassion for the fear. When I have compassion for my own fear and the fear of the world, it doesn't have as much power. Then I tune into the frequency of love. Love is who and what I am. We are walking through this together. It is possible that this is a profound moment in human history where we have an opportunity to wake up to our greatest possibility. Why do I know this is a moment where we have the profound possibility of a greater awakening? Because every moment is that. Every moment is a moment we have a greater possibility to our for our awakening. But in this moment in human history, I think we are being called to look within, to reconnect with what's truly important, to ask myself, how do I truly live? Am I afraid of my own mortality? And is that keeping me stuck and not living? It's such an interesting paradox. I'm afraid of dying. So I'm gonna stay over here with all my barricades up and I'm not, I'm not living. So the invitation is for you to live your most dynamic life in this moment, tapping into the essential beingness of who and what you are. And from that, we start to radiate that love and light out into the world. And that is the only way consciousness actually ever has changed. Few, through a few small, small group of people that gets magnified and magnified and magnified. Not that group of people that has the same point of view or perspective, but the frequency of love. That frequency of love is beyond any opinion. It's a beyond any point of view. It's beyond any political system. It's beyond any al alliance that we've created out of our egos. This is the moment for us to tap into the love that we are Honor the fear, but don't tune into that and get swept away from it. So as always, I'm so incredibly honored to be with your community. And I look forward to our conversation and our questions. And this is really fun for me. So I appreciate and honor the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you, TJ. Thank you. We're so glad you're here. And I'm tracking comments and taking notes. And I love... Um, you said emotions are a part of our experience, you know, and you called it guideposts. And I love that. I've always called emotions my divine alarm clock, but I think that's a really great um, concept for us to get because I think many of us anyway, it was for me, um, for some reason we get this idea that we're supposed to, you know, move away from that or, or resist it and all that. And so really looking at like, oh, this is my guidepost shi sh shining or my divine alarm clock bringing me a message, letting me know what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I can ask what's going on, you know, exactly. what's That's wrong with me. I love looking at it as like an emotion is letting me know something needs attention. Because it, it doesn't mean there's something right or wrong. It's just, there. oh, there's something there. I'm curious about that. And then when, when we can shift from judgment to curiosity, we can actually open up to what the emotion is wanting to reveal. 
Um, one practice that I use in meditation uh, is, I wonder what this emotion is wanting to reveal to me in this moment. Is there a message right now in what I'm feeling? Right. And I love this too, because this, this helps me um, move right back into compassion. You mentioned compassion and, you know, just being in that frequency of love and compassion is my, my way right into the frequency of love constantly because, um, well, that's where I want to be, but asking those um, questions about others as well. You know, it's like, just like me, they have opinions and they have um, thoughts and ideas about things, they <clears throat> perspectives, points of view, and I might not agree with them, but just like me, they have an experience around it. So I can be very compassionate. I can tune right into that compassion of they're human just like me. <laughs> yeah, and like I'm thinking about it in terms of like as a counselor, when I when I used to see people one-on-one, -on -one, the greatest gift I could offer my client is to, uh, to have an intimate relationship with my own emotions. Because when I'm able to lean into and feel whatever is present for me, I can mm -hmm. create a space where someone else can do that too. When I go into judgment, I stop it, right? And so... Um, it's not, it's not usually conscious for people, but a lot of times we have a point of view of, you know, you shouldn't be feeling that. I shouldn't be feeling right. that. So that's the, the ultimate compassion. Right, for sure. Yeah, I totally agree. Okay, so let's check our, our feed here. I've got my phone, so <clears throat> checking in with everybody. And so um, let me see, I'm not sure if I am in order. Jenny says, even the term shelter in place is associated with active shooter scenario. So changing our words, staying at home is less threatening. Okay. Um, that was the comment. So Ron has a question. The question becomes how to deepen a sense of safety in the context of perceived isolation and loneliness. Yeah. So can you, can you ask that again? The question becomes how to deepen a sense of safety in the context of perceived isolation and loneliness. Yeah, so that's from Ron. So I know Ron, I know, I think I know where Ron's going with this, right? Because true safety is an inside job, right? And I know that right now at Brentwood, uh, you all are doing um, conscious recovery book study. And I think you're about to the chapter, which is creating safety. And looking through the recovery lens, I identify that as the important first step of recovery. But we could also say the most important first step for our well being, for our spiritual growth and evolution. And true safety is an inside job, right? Because if I'm hooked to the safety of the world, what happens when we have this, you know, thing that happens where they say, you know, all these businesses are closed. In other words, there's this jarring experience. And if I'm not centered in my being, I get thrown off from that, right? And again, the last thing I want to do is judge myself about that because I've gotten thrown off by this. I've had moments where I, I, I notice my fear and then I examine that fear and start to question it and let it move through me. But I think what Ron is saying is during this time of perceived isolation, and I love that he said it that way because is it true that we're isolated right now? That's just something to be in. And if you notice your mind went to an answer, <clears throat> I wanna invite you, oh, are there other possible answers here? Mm -hmm. uh, living in that question. So true safety, I think, is what is Ron is speaking to is really knowing deeply that the internal safety and part of that is connecting, well, the deepest part of that is connecting with source energy, mm -hmm. that truth that I am. And then from there, my thoughts and feelings don't have as much power over me because many of us bite the hook, bite the hook, the hook of fear. But mostly it's my own thoughts that I hook to. See, I am right. You know, well, he says that. he, in a few more comments down, he said, I find that resistance is amplified right now. Mm -hmm. I don't experience connectedness. My unconscious thoughts feel all too real. Yeah. So thank you, Ron. Thank you for your authenticity and your vulnerability to share yeah. um, feelings that that many are feeling, many people are feeling. So Jan says, yes, my state of freedom is an inside job. Let me see, question from Beverly. How can I have my thoughts lead me to abundance and yet avoid destructive emotions? What if there's no such thing as a destructive emotion, right? So going back to that, what if I'm curious about my <laughs> collective view? One practice my friend Jeremy and I love doing is it's a very simple question. 
what would I be experiencing without the story, right? So many times we'll have an emotion uh, and then we'll go into a story about the emotion. I'm feeling this because, as a matter of fact, the, the mind almost always wants to figure out why we're feeling something. Why am I feeling this way? That's the, that's the, um, the great, um, I don't even know what, what word to use, but that's what the mind does. And asking the mind to stop thinking is like asking the lungs to stop breathing. It's what it does. So if we can shift out of thinking about destructive emotions and then look at that, because that's a thought, this emotion is destructive. Mm -hmm. Can I be present with what I'm feeling? Can I be curious about it? Because most of the time, what I hear people saying, this is most of the time, not everyone, but there's a point of view somehow that if I feel this, I'm going to get stuck. But the truth is the opposite. Feelings or emotions, if we look at a very, very small child, pre-programmed human, usually two or three, they feel them. They, ex you know, they, we would call it maybe they explode with the emotions, but they let us see what they're feeling. And then if you notice, they go right back to joy, right back to happiness. And then somehow we all get start getting taught that it's not okay to feel sad or it's not okay to feel angry. I mean, how many times have I watched something, you know, whether it's an interview or a TV show and someone will say, I'm just feeling really, really sad. And someone will say, oh, don't be sad. You don't need to be sad. And they'll go into all the reasons they shouldn't be sad. I worked with um, a young man once uh, in my practice years ago, he was in his 20s and his father died when he was nine years old, I believe. And he had a mother and two sisters. And he said, not one, not two, not three, but countless people walked up to him at nine and said, you're the man of the family now. You need to be strong. Don't be sad. And he said the message was like, so it, he shut down at that moment. Right. So he kept being told, don't feel what you're feeling. His father had just died. What did he need at that moment? It's OK for you to feel sad. How are you doing? How are you doing? So if we can shift out of the paradigm of destructive feelings and look at them with curiosity, allow ourselves to feel them and recognize that they pass through us, then we can return to our natural state, which is joy. And hopefully I answered that question or that comment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me see what other questions we have here. TJ, just what I needed to hear. Ronnie says, yes, I feel like emotions, especially, especially those that disturb me, are telling me what to let, what I need to let go of. Um, such gratitude to you, TJ, reminds me of a book from years ago, Fear, Fear, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Not yeah. exactly the same, but definitely the idea of acknowledging my feelings, being curious about them rather than in judgment. Yeah, and what Ronnie just spoke to, I love because I get to see if I have an attachment, right? So I might have right. this emotional experience. And again, if we can move out of the judgment of it, oh, look, I'm having this emotion. I wonder what's there. Oh, I'm attached to a point of view. That, and that, that may not always be true, but sometimes it is, right? Yeah. And so he said, what I need to let go of. And I would just say, where is the attachment? Can I become curious about that? Yeah, yeah the awareness around because we don't need to produce joy and happiness. What if joy and happiness is our natural state? Mm. And then if we can allow ourselves to feel whatever else is there, we can return to that. Not from a place of, oh, it's good to feel joy and happiness, but that is, I think, our natural state. We come into this world that way. So the more I unlearn and the more I question, the more I return to that, that's sort of the baseline. The baseline is happiness and joy. I agree. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. That's that's exactly what I think. Okay, so um, let me see if there's any more questions. Yes, we're discussing chapter four this Tuesday. We invite you. Oh, maybe this was answering something else, Jan. Um, Maria says, uh, Abraham and Seth say that every death is suicide. So we decide when it's time to go. Why dwell upon it? Let's enjoy this time. Let me see, any other questions? Anybody has any questions or comments for TJ? Yeah, and I'll, 
while you're doing that, I'll speak yeah. to that comment too. That's right. I mean, we focus, I have spent, I spent so many years focusing on something that wasn't happening now, the perceived not now. Mm. What if this happens? What if that yeah. happens? You know, and, and, you know, I remember, I think I've told this story before, probably at Brentwood, but I had these two beautiful little chihuahuas. It was my, they were my first dogs as adults. And I woke up one day, literally had never considered that they would probably die before I did. And I'm, you know, I'm fully into my 40s at this point, right? So this is our 30s, I think. And so it was like, oh, life really is impermanent in the outer realm. Can I make peace with that? And then I, I leaned into that for a moment. And then I recognized that one of the reasons I think pets are so precious to us is we know they're not going to be here forever. Now, from one point of view, someone might say, well, that's kind of dark, but it's actually freedom. The preciousness of this moment with this beautiful being sitting in front of me that is a dog or a cat, a pet, they're here, we're here sharing this time together for, an, uh, we don't know how long, mm -hmm. but the reality is that we have an eternity together if I live in the now. And that's what, when Eckhart Tolle is talking about the power of now, he's not talking about living at 11.09 a.m. on Sunday, whatever day it is. He's talking about the eternal presence of now. Mm. And most of us are distracted by thoughts of the past and the future. And we end up spending our whole life not living. And so making peace with the impermanence of the outer realm of life is one of the keys to living fully. And when we live in the eternal now, we're less afraid of what might happen because the truth is we don't know what's going to happen. None of us really know what will happen in the coming hours, days, or weeks, but that's always been the case. There's a huge freedom in making peace with that. The mind wants to solve it at the level of relative reality. And it doesn't mean we don't work in relative reality, but there's a greater reality in the midst of that as well. Absolutely. And I think the, this next question, and we'll, we'll um, close with this question. I think you really answered it, but let, let me just touch on it in case there's something else that comes, comes through. So uh, Christy says, thank you for helping us make the um, difference between honoring our fear, but tapping into love. Question, having a predisposition, how do I deal with someone else who is not as careful as I am? So I so I fear is that, so my fear maybe is that I do not have control over my physical well-being. Mm. Well, there are a couple things I'll say about that. One is the greatest gift I can offer anyone in my life is to recognize that there's not another, right? And so, you know, the, the story goes that the person went to the spiritual master to say, how do I learn to forgive others? And the master says, there are no others. Right, so that might sound a little esoteric for this scenario, but I think it's always a starting point, mm -hmm. right? I'm one with this person. I actually tend to think or believe, and again, you heard I said think or believe, this is not a feeling, but this is a thought. What if I'm really um, transparent and honest and vulnerable with the person that I'm uh, in relationship with? What if we have an authentic conversation about this? Mm -hmm. I have, um, the experience, my experience has shown me when I bring my full self into the room and I recognize my judgment, right? Because I used to say when I let go of all my judgments and then I realized that's so far in my existence, that's not happened. So when I recognize my judgments and then I invite myself to tap into something truer, um, what is it you really want to communicate? Is there something beyond the fear of your physical well-being? That might be a question. What do you really desire in this relationship? What are you really looking for? Is it touching something um, deeper or different than just the physical? So these are all different questions. And then asking myself, what is true safety? What is true mm -hmm. safety? What is well-being? Physical, emotional, spiritual, mental. What does well-being look like in all of those rooms? How do I communicate that from an authentic place? Mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. Beautiful, beautiful answer. Um, okay, let's see. I think Kathy j j might have a question. Through meditation, I went to a future place where I imagined 
If I had worked through all the emotions of our current situation, imagined how I would feel if I had a resolution. I brought the future feeling of resolution to the present and now a sense of freedom and love. Hope that makes sense. Yeah. It does. It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, because that, that, that's the power of the imagination, right? Imagine um, what I think I hear Kathy saying is imagine that we're at a place where all of this is resolved and then go into the feeling tone of that and look for how that gets resolved and then bring that to present moment awareness. One of the things that Michael Beckwith said when I heard him speak once, which once, which was really powerful, he said he was having an issue with one of his knees and he, instead of focusing on the knee with the issue, he focused mm -hmm. on the knee that was whole and well and got into the frequency of that and felt the vibration of the healthy knee and then took that vibration over to the knee that there was a perceived out of balance and that's how the healing began. And look at that for a moment and really lean into that. You know, when we're looking at the problem, the perceived problem and trying to fix it, uh, there's something much more powerful. And that is, as Kathy's saying, what would resolution look like, feel like? What's the tone of that? What's the frequency? And is it possible I can tap into that frequency now and then bring that frequency into this moment because that's that's the collective consciousness. The collective consciousness is we should be very, very afraid right now. Okay, yes. And I also know that this is true and this is a greater reality. Can I bring it into the now? And I think life's an experiment. So let's try it and see what happens. I love that. I agree. It is an experiment. That's the creation. That's the that's the fun part of this. <laughs> is that we get to, to choose and we, and I, I love that. I mean, that was perfect, perfect way to end. Yeah. That wraps it all up in a nice little package. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you for the questions and comments. Um, thank you, TJ. We love you and appreciate you. Our hearts are full. So I just wanna remind everybody that we have our Zoom call. Um, get a candle ready if you'd like to join us. And the link is right here on the Facebook page or on our homepage. And our weekly groups are meeting, they're, they're in action. And I am so grateful for all of you uh, leaders who are um, really putting your hearts into those groups and all of you who are attending the groups. I mean, they're just full and abundant and uh, we're just excited about that. So join a weekly group, jump in, the Zoom links are all over. All you have to do is pop on. And if it's okay with you, Amy, I would love to close us with a prayer. I would love that. Um, let me see, was there anything else I needed to, um, touch on no i think that was i would think that was it so yeah so let's let's okay so just that. inviting us all to take a moment move within taking a nice deep breath together so how grateful i am to know that there is one one power one presence source energy infinite beingness all those different names that point to the eternal now the truth of our being and i know this source energy is my life and it's the life of each and every one of us connected right here in this moment. And because we've come together today to play in the field of infinite possibilities, we have experienced a profound shift, a shift in our awareness from fear to possibility, honoring and welcoming the entire experience that we call human and tapping into the greater experience of our infinite potential. So with great gratitude, I release this knowing in the realm of spirit, it is already done. We simply open up to our infinite possibilities now, knowing with absolute certainty that we are vibrant beings, healthy, expansive, and infinite. And so it is. So it is. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'll see you on Zoom. Love you all. Appreciate you, TJ. Thank you. Mm -hmm.